Thank you so much, Laura, and good morning, colleagues from across the SADAC region. It really is a pleasure for me to join you on this first online knowledge sharing session. And thank you to USB Ed for inviting me to contribute and participate in this event. So for the short segment, I will be sharing on erasing borders, imagining a harmonized political economy in Africa. And I think this is an interesting topic and an interesting idea to share on because it is well rooted in our history, in the history of the African continent through movements such as Pan-Africanism and ideas of a united Africa that were forwarded by the likes of Kwame Nkrumah. It's also an idea and that is well rooted in current initiatives today, such as the African Continental Free Trade Agreement and the African Continental Free Trade Area, which I'll be discussing in a bit more detail. And finally, it's a harmonized political economy in Africa is a cornerstone of the African Union Agenda 2063 uh, vision for the continent into the next 40 years. So this is an interesting topic to discuss uh, from a historical as well as present day moment and from a futures oriented perspective as well. So I'm looking forward to sharing some ideas on that. Uh, as as uh, Laura mentioned, I'm Dr. Njeri Mwageru. I'm the senior futurist at the Institute for Futures Research at the University of Stellenbosch Business School. And I will be sharing a little bit more uh, about what I do uh, in, in the course of the session. So to give you an idea of what the session will entail, I'll start with a brief overview of strategic foresight and futures thinking as we apply it at the Institute for Futures Research at the IFR. And then I will be discussing or sharing some thoughts around erasing borders. And I want to center this conversation around two tensions, or, uh, fragmentation, fragmentation in the continent, fragmentation around the idea of a united Africa, but also around the concept of cohesion and what are the movements that we can track that are moving towards an integrated uh, African region. And then I'll share some uh, views and imaginings from a futures perspective on a harmonized political economy in Africa, specifically in context of the current ongoing uh, coronavirus COVID-19 pandemic. So that is the session outline. As Laura mentioned, if you have any interesting thoughts or questions that come up during the session, please do drop a note in the chat box. And at the end, we will have some time for Q&A. And please use your um, hand raising symbol so that we may try to get to you. I doubt we'll be able to answer all questions, but let's make it as interactive as possible. Um, and I hope that you are able to resonate with some of the ideas shared this morning. So to start, I think it's good to give you an idea of the Institute for Futures Research because Stellenbosch University is unique in that it is the only academic institution uh, in the whole of the African continent that offers academic programs in future studies. And the Institute for Futures Research considers itself to have one foot in academia and one foot in industry as well. And the work we do is uh, growing qualified futurists uh, through academic and as well as practical training. We also um, deal with rapid change and increasing complexity through our research, through our uh, environmental scanning, tracking trends, and also facilitating our stakeholder base, our clients to deal with rapid change and complexity as well. And I'll share a bit more about our approach. And we work within a values framework. So we do have a normative um, angle to the work we do. We pursue uh, creating desirable futures futures with um, an S, so plural, because we believe that there are multiple futures, multiple possible futures that could unfold. And this is the lens that I will be applying in discussing the possible futures of an integrated and harmonized political economy uh, mm -hmm. on the continent. So the other aspect about um, the futures research um, is we, we do, research that has global impact and our intention is to facilitate innovative long-range decision making so we look uh, at time horizons you know beyond your sort of one three five year strategic plans looking more into your uh, 10 20 40 50 even 100 years and further 
And our focus, as we are the only uh, institute of our kind on Africa, is very much within the African continent and on African issues. But we take, uh, of course, we were framed within an international community. We're framed within a, a global and globalized context as well. And the purpose is really to anticipate risk and to facilitate um, our clients and our stakeholders to anticipate changes and to maximize on the opportunities that are available for their businesses um, for their communities, as well as for their countries and their states. And we'll be discussing these levels today as well. And how this translates is a focus on South African futures. The Institute has been established since 1974. And then we also have an African futures portfolio, which is the portfolio that I lead. And I will be sharing mostly around the African futures from an African futures lens. And we do commissioned research as well as workshops. So training um, in terms of future methods, short courses. We also facilitate with a particular thematic based uh, futures analysis and scenario planning, depending on the requests of the clients and stakeholders that we work with. So we consider ourselves to, to think uh, abstractly and to think long term, but we, we very much locate ourselves within a practical um, application as well. And future studies and strategic foresight is important. And I think the corona and the COVID-19 epidemic is a clear illustration of the volatility, the uncertainty, and the complexity that we are engaged with um, in this era of accelerating change and in this era of ambiguity. So future thinking and strategic foresight offers us a frame to make sense of the multiple changes and shifts that are occurring at a very rapid pace. And it gives us some tools to help us navigate this context because we don't really know what the future will bring. But from a futures perspective, we do believe that there is information available to allow us to at least anticipate different options and possibilities and how we could prepare for these. It's important to, to state that uh, within the strategic foresight field, we don't predict the future. And my conversation today is not going to be predicting what an, uh, an African integrated political economy would look like, but it is to anticipate and imagine different possibilities towards helping us make better decisions, as I mentioned. And this is really towards being prepared, towards being future fit, towards being ready. Uh, and we consider this more important than being right. So it's not about anticipating, you know, the next markets, this is helpful, um, but it's really about anticipating trends that will allow us to position ourselves in how markets, states, contexts may be unfolding in a way that allows us to respond optimally, maximizing on the opportunities and mitigating away from the risks. And we look towards what we call the fringe or the periphery, which is we question the status quo. So we try to make sense of a current events today, um, but towards ch change making. So de developing new insights towards generating new values um, and towards generating new value in terms of models um, and performance and creating better futures and better futures on the basis also of alternative approaches and on um, interesting and innovative ways of applying our new insights, of applying our sense making and applying our understanding of the trends that we are engaging with. So just to give you a quote of what strategic foresight is, and I will be using this frame as we discuss the, um, the possibilities of a political economy in Africa that's integrated and harmonized, uh, specifically around the African continental free trade. So strategic foresight is the ability to create and maintain a high quality, coherent and functional forward view and to apply the insights in useful ways. Again, not to predict the future, but to generate insights that can facilitate us preparing ourselves functionally for the long term. And it really is about um, identifying new trends and eventualities that you may need to respond to, detecting adverse conditions, and the best approaches that can guide policy and also shape strategy. And as the African continental free trade area is such a new initiative, strategic foresight is an apt approach to begin to think around what Africa could look like in the next decade, uh, but into the next 40 years and 2063, when the agenda uh, vision 2063 is intended to have been achieved. So there we go. 
at the Institute for Futures Research, we focus on a number of themes. And I'm sharing this slide because I would like you participants uh, in the different countries and in the different locations to think around the futures of Africa um, and the African continental free trade area with these themes in mind. So the new world of business, what would an integrated Africa look like for business, for industry, for trade? If we were to erase borders, what would be the practical implications, but also what would be the long-term and short-term trade-offs and gains that we would need to consider? What are the risks? And then social capital. Africa, as we know, is the youngest continent in the world. How are we preparing ourselves educationally in terms of our human resources, training and development capacities? to meet the opportunities being presented by an integrated free trade area for the continent. And what does this mean for sustainability, for green economies? As we're integrating the continent, are we intending to perpetuate industrial models that we can clearly see have got shortcomings leading to issues of climate change and increased natural disasters? But for instance, Africa is a major um, uh, area that, that suffers from, from this. So how is sustainability featuring within the African continental free trade area and the policy movements towards making this a reality? And then security. Security, of course, in terms of the conflicts. And as we know, Africa is a largely destabilized a security area in the world. Uh, we are highly susceptible to terrorism. We still have unstable social political contexts, but also security in terms of cybersecurity and what we're beginning to see now in terms of data wars um, and the new data colonialism. So how do we protect the continent across different fronts um, of engagement? engagement. And technology and innovation, of course, is uh, as we're on the brink of the fourth industrial revolution and as I connect with you now online, uh, an integrated political economy in Africa already has the tools available to begin to realize this vision in very practical ways in terms of the operational engagements of businesses, of individuals, societies, communities, and even education systems. And what kind of decision making, what kind of leadership would an integrated Africa require? As we look into the future, uh, the art and science of decision making is an important one to consider. And I will be um, invoking some of these themes as we go forward. So do keep these things in mind uh, as we move into the next part of the conversation. So just to situate uh, how we'll be engaging with the idea of erasing borders on the continent, as I mentioned, I would like to locate it within a conversation of the African continental free trade area, and I'll be giving a brief background um, of what it is, where we are now with the ACTFA, um, and what we may expect. And I would like to consider the African continental free trade area, as I mentioned briefly, in terms of two main tensions, and that is the, the pull towards a fragmentation, which is very much a condition and a characteristic of the continent, but also cohesion and the possibilities of unifying and integrating the continent and how this may implement and how this may um, impact the implementation of the African continental free trade area. And finally, how can we take the African continental free trade area as an example of an initiative that's being undertaken by heads of states um, and members of the African Union uh, and use it to imagine a harmonized political economy in Africa? And I'll be closing the conversation on that specifically, as I mentioned, in the context of the ongoing pandemic and some of the issues that we may need to keep in mind. The African Continental Free Trade Area. This is a very exciting initiative because it is the largest regional free trade area in the world in terms of the number of member states that constitute it. Um, apart from the World Trade Organization, which is not too functional uh, these days, uh, the African Continental Free Trade Area will be the next second largest one, uh, so the largest regional one. And um, it really became operationalized in 2019 at the 12th Extraordinary Summit. And it is a flagship project of the Agenda 2063. And I want to unpack some of these aspects just a little bit more to give some clarity. Agenda 2063 is a vision for the continent uh, into the next 40 years. It was established in 2013, and the year 2063 was chosen because it was 50 years after uh, 2013, but also because it would have been 100 years since the establishment of the Organization of African Unity, which is now the African Union as of 2000. 
And the Agenda 2063 is really a blueprint and a framework for shaping an integrated a continent that is politically stable, that is economically prosperous, that is socially integrated um, and educated with, with human capital that's, um, that's healthy, and the, a continent that is a strong player on the international front as well. So the, inter, the African Continental Free Trade Area is a flagship project under this initiative to achieve an Africa we want by 2063. In terms of the actual free trade area, it would be combining a population of 1.2 billion people and counting, as we know Africa has got uh, the fastest growing population uh, globally. It would also combine uh, the GDP across African states of over 3 trillion US dollars, uh, which is exciting, and set to grow as well because it's 3 trillion US dollars as we sit, and it's anticipated that going forward, um, even by 2022, uh, an extra 70 billion US dollars could be added to the combined GDP of the continent should the African continental free trade area be enacted in time. And it's, it aims to facilitate the free movement of people, uh, goods and capital as well. To give you a brief timeline of the key aspects of the continental free trade area, it was a decision that was established in 2012. So from 2012 to 2018, uh, about five years uh, before countries at, uh, in the Kigali summit, as they call it, uh, 44 African countries signed the African Continental Free Trade Agreement in 2018 after making the decision to establish. And then in 2019, the heads of state, after 2018, there was a scattering of additional signatures. And we now stand at 54 African states having signed the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement. And the only country that hasn't signed is Eritrea, but they are on board to sign pretty soon. They were caught up in some conflict situations that made it difficult for them to sign at the same time as their other African uh, countries. And in 2019, it was agreed that uh, the operational phase of the African Continental Free Trade Area could be launched and the Secretariat was established in Ghana, headed by a South African uh, individual who was in charge and a key um, contributor to the negotiations around establishing the agreement. And now we are tracking with a lot of interest what the next steps would be, particularly in the current context of COVID-19, where as opposed to borders opening, we're seeing borders closing, and of course in the context of increasing protectionism internationally as well. So what are the next steps? In terms of a regional integration process, the continental free trade area would um, it would proceed in increasing harmonization and integration towards eventually a political union. And as I mentioned, this is not uh, an idea that is unattainable. It is a vision that is well rooted in our history, and it is also part of the African Continental um, Agenda 2063 and the movements and initiatives that heads of state are undertaking within this ambit. So after establishing the continental free trade area, which would remove barriers, uh, remove tariffs, uh, up to 90% of tariffs African countries are committed to removing uh, with, within the year 2020, uh, and we'll track that. And then moving into a customs union and a common market, which would mean that the African bloc would trade as a cohesive whole with other external partners and have common policies with external partners as well. And heading towards an economic union, which would mean there's common economic policies, common taxation, fiscal policies, and similar to the EU, there could also be um, a single currency for the region or uh, a, a range of currencies within the different regions in Africa um, that facilitate the economic and monetary union as well. And having ratified and harmonized the, uh, the economy of the continent, it would then make sense to move into political union and to have the legal policy frameworks that shape the continent and the operations of African states uh, harmoniously across agreed norms and rules as well. So in terms of an African regional economic integration process, the African free trade area would be one step towards eventually a unified, harmonized political economy for the continent, uh, hopefully within the next 40 years. 
But I would like to discuss um, the possibilities of this uh, progression along these steps of integration. As I mentioned, thinking about the fragmentation on the continent in terms of what separates us, but also the cohesion that exists on the continent and what combines. And therefore, what are the possibilities uh, for the next 40 years and the attainment of this ambitious vision? Let's start with fragmentation. Africa is one of the most fragmented continents uh, in the world. We have 55 African states, and we still have some issues of cessation uh, ongoing within these African states. We have over 2,000 different ethnicities, over 2,000 different languages, and we are an extremely diverse continent. The frustration around, um, often in the media, comparisons of Africa with China uh, indicates that uh, Africans themselves acknowledge we're extremely diverse and it's frustrating to be considered a country when we're actually made up of 55 very differently structured uh, political nation states. We also have different levels of development across these different African countries, which adds to their diversity and different structures and regimes as well. So we're not harmonized in terms of how our state systems function. We're also extremely diverse culturally. And while we have over um, 55 African states and 2,000 ethnicities, we believe that there may be even more sub-ethnicities and sub-identities that exist within the African continent, each of them as meaningful to the Africans that hold to them. And there is within the soci uh, sociological and anthropological field where they study culture, this perception that in Africa, the identity really is rooted uh, in the community and in the clan and in kinship, and then into ethnicity and in tribe and cultural group. And then finally, nation state and then continent in terms of a region. So in terms of an identity or a cultural um, whole, Africa is extremely diverse and it may not be as straightforward to combine the continent under a one Africa ideology. And what are the current regional economic groupings that we see on the continent? This is just a diagram to indicate that we already have quite a few uh, regional economic groupings and communities on the continent, and African states tend to be members of more than one. So if we look at, um, for instance, South Africa, um, Lesotho, and Swaziland, we'll see that South Africa, Lesotho, and uh, Namibia, Botswana are part of the South African, uh, Southern African uh, Customs Union. They're also part of the Southern African Development Community. Uh, Swaziland is also part of COMESA, um, which is the common market of Eastern and Southern African states. And you can see all across Africa, we have countries that stretch uh, their membership from um, their regions they're geographically located to, uh, to, for instance, Somalia, it's located in the Horn of Africa, but it's also considered within the Sahel, mostly because of its cultural background. So in terms of the current economic groupings within the continent, there's a lot of diversity and uh, multiple membership across these different groupings as well. So there's a bit of fragmentation there. And the norms and rules and procedures of these economic communities are also not yet harmonized. And within a global context, uh, it's also a time of extreme fragmentation and protectionism. We've been tracking the trade wars between the US and China. And as the COVID-19 pandemic has been unfolding and borders have been closing, we're seeing extreme disruptions to the global distribution um, value chain, and we're still to understand what the repercussions will be for the economies across the world, but especially for African economies. So it's not the best time to be thinking of integrating the continent, especially when there are uh, health issues to consider, when economies that are very externally oriented, as most African economies are, uh, are grappling with the uh, reduction of uh, trade with traditional partners within the international community. So it's a difficult time to be thinking of integration and multilateralism uh, in a time of protectionism and to use Donald Trump's famous phrase in a time of America first. So where is Africa in this context?
At the same time, Africa, and this is moving more towards the cohesion tension and the cohesion dynamics and to what um, combines and unifies the continent. At the same time, Africa has 30% of the world's resources and it's very much a shared continent. Even if we were to shift from a fossil fuel based industry, as you can see, this particular map shows that petroleum um, is one of the key resources on the continent. But even if we were to shift away from fossil fuel based industries, we still find the core elements and the rare metals required to facilitate uh, the digitization of the fourth industrial revolution are found, for instance, within mines in the Congo um, and found within um, natural resource pockets that are unique to the continent. So Africa is very much a shared uh, geographical and resource space in that the resources that we have here are relevant and valuable to the whole world. At another level in terms of cohesion, uh, Africa is also a shared idea as the origin of humankind, as the birthplace of modern humanity. So Africa is also claimed by multiple international communities as a shared concept and as a shared identity. And this is also a core factor towards establishing um, an integrated political economy within the continent that operates as a cohesive whole, even within the international and the development arenas. And politically, we can see within the African Union and the African Continental Free Trade Area is a flagship project being driven by the African Union that we politically there are uh, attempts to begin to um, merge the different 55 African states into, into larger blocks. So not so much the regional economic blocks that I've already discussed and which are multiple and have multiple memberships from different African countries but also looking at the continent in terms of these geopolitical regions and beginning to organize the continent according to these geopolitical regions. And there is a strong movement in terms of uh, structures, institutions, procedures, and policies that are showing the integration of Africa according to Northwest, Central, East, and South Africa, but also including the diaspora. And the diaspora includes those who consider themselves to be of African descent, regardless of race, um, and who are also committed to contributing to the upliftment and prosperity of the continent. So we are seeing in terms of a geopolitical organization of the continent, a cohesion and an integration and a unity developing there, driven particularly by the African Union. And what would be the benefits? Why perhaps might a dynamic of cohesion be more attractive than the dynamic of fragmentation? Um, why might a dynamic of cohesion pull Africa from a history of fragmentation more towards a unified political economy? Because it stimulates economic growth by combining uh, and harmonizing rules. It facilitates efficiency of operations. It encourages the development of trade infrastructure that allows the continent to be more connected to itself. And it also can contribute to social development through, for instance, encouraging and promoting peace um, to, to, to support trade and to support business growth and development on the continent. Currently, as we sit, Africa has one of the lowest, if not the lowest rate of intra-regional uh, trade, whereas um, the Europe and Asia are more towards 60% 60 uh, 60 integration regionally. Africa operates at about 50 to 20% uh, integration of their trade across both imports and exports. So there's room for growth there. And particularly with the COVID-19 pandemic that we are um, under, that we are experiencing, we're realizing that intra-Africa trade may be a very important and in fact critical resilience measure for the continent to reduce our over-reliance and dependency on other international regions. As we stand, uh, China's economy is um, taking some very hard hits due to the lockdown that it imposed um, over the first couple of months of 2020. And they're expecting um, a reduction of um, the growth in China, which will impact the world economy, but also Africa. Uh, they are anticipating at least 2.1 uh, to 2% might be shaved off the expected uh, growth of the economy of the continent in 2020, simply due to the shifts and um, 
barriers and obstacles that are being faced within the, the Asian economies and the European economies as well. So intra-Africa trade is a resilience measure that is important to consider. And especially going forward, as we anticipate that the pandemic uh, may be more long term than initially expected and um, could spread into the next two years, not just in terms of economic recovery, but in terms of the health response as well, uh, we might begin to realize that the disruptions to the global supply chains and to the global distribution chains, uh, chains are extremely impactful for the continent. And therefore, we need to consider alternatives, including trading more amongst ourselves. We're also seeing that it's important to consider border management and the movement of people. At the Kigali summit, as I mentioned during uh, on the slide that was talking about the timeline for the African continental free trade area, another agreement was signed was um, one that facilitates the movement, the free movement of people. And there are already uh, actions towards um, establishing a united Africa passport that would allow Africans to travel all on the same passport, similar to the Schengen visa area within the EU. But in rolling out this initiative, the importance of border management will be critical, particularly uh, within a health pandemic situation where we need to restrict or be very careful about the movements of people and the possibilities of um, cross infection. The other issue that the COVID-19 is highlighting on a more positive aspect, and this is an opportunity for the continent perhaps to maximize on this crisis, is it's demonstrating that governments do have the capacity and do have the will to act when necessary and when pushed towards a tipping point. And I think this has been an eye-opening experience for many governments across the world, but particularly within Africa. We are tracking to see uh, the functionality response of our governments uh, in terms of this pandemic and using this as a signal to anticipate how else governments may be mobilized to act outside of the health pandemic, for instance, towards mobilizing free trade across the continent. The pandemic is also showing that there is a desperate need for new models. There are numerous discussions and critiques around how this will only be the beginning of a series of health crises that we can expect to face, you, uh, mostly due to um, our encroachment into natural and wildlife areas and to climate change issues that are resulting in the release of multiple uh, micro um, uh, bodies that we do not have capacity, we do not have antibodies, we do not have um, the immune systems to respond to. So there's a need for new models and as the African continental free trade area is very much a fresh initiative, this may be an opportunity for Africa to think of new ways to integrate the continent, to industrialize the continent, keeping sustainability in mind. In terms of imagining a harmonized political economy for the continent, the main point to reflect on is it is an idea whose time perhaps has come. Not only because it is an idea that's rooted in the initial leadership um, structures and visions of a post-colonial Africa, but also because it is an idea that is being pursued today by the African Union actively. And the African Union have committed to actioning the uh, African continental free trade area by July 2020, regardless of the COVID pandemic. So we will watch and see if this will be possible. But also looking to the future, we're beginning to realize that even in times of protectionism, as the health pandemic has shown, cooperation across borders is essential. We have the tools such as digital tools and 4IR to facilitate connections across borders and to facilitate the practical implementation of policies that seek to harmonize and integrate the political and economic regions and aspects of the continent. So going forward, I do imagine that an integrated political economy for the continent may be possible, keeping in mind the various challenges we have to face and the need to balance between the dynamics of fragmentation, as well as the dynamics and the opportunities offered by cohesion. And those are my brief thoughts. Um, I know that I pushed through, but I would like to open it up now for your reflections. If you have anything to share, any questions, any concerns, any ideas that you would like to um, share with the group as well in terms of your own imaginings of an integrated political economy in Africa.
Africa. And please do use um, the, the hand raising signal and then we can unmute you and it would be good to hear your voice if you have any questions to share. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Nijeri. Um, yes, we would really like to welcome your questions at this time. Um, if you click on the panel at the bottom, the participant panel, you should see a raise hand functionality. Please do raise your hand and we will unmute you and then you can uh, ask your question. It would be great to, to hear from you. Hi, Injury, it's Trish here from USB Ed. Hi, Trish. Hi, I just have a question on um, the connectivity across the African continent. So is there a view, like a graphic of how this varies country to country on average? Thanks, Trish. I'll take a few questions and then we, will, we can answer them uh, comprehensively. I see we also have Kerry. Kerry, go ahead. Um, I've just got a, a, a question on, you know, obviously this, the European Union and this Brexit scenario must have been quite an interesting um, scenario to impact the, uh, you know, this, the Africa Free Trade Agreements. Um, so, that, so, you know, I, I think that would be quite an interesting discussion to have, whether it be now or, you know, or later on. But, you know, in terms of the challenges, I would imagine that there are some countries that are quite nervous about the implications of their trade because, you know, some countries obviously contribute more currently than others. So I would imagine that, you know, maybe, um, you know South Africa and Nigeria are big contributors to, to trade in Africa already and that they're more nervous to to engage in this, um, you know, as you mentioned, there, there, are various, there are various agreements. So there's a free movement agreement you mentioned. So I'd imagine that some countries are, are a bit more wary of engaging in these discussions than others are. And I would just like your, you know, your, your opinions on this. Thanks, Kerry. Um, shall we go ahead and take Nom, Nomvula, Nomvulak? You're unmuted. Yeah. Okay, good morning all. Um, I'm just appreciating the fact that you take us through the trade area, which kind of links to the common market and the economic union. But um, I'm just wondering, particularly now that we're faced with this COVID-19, the economies are threatened. Uh, and and the, for instance, the partial lockdown and the full lockdown is mainly determined by, by such economic strength. So are there any agreements around that, uh, particularly now? Thank you. And we'll take one more for this round from Tini. Hi, Jerry. Um, yeah, I think my question relates um, to what Kerry has asked. Um, are there any learnings from the European Union and even continents like South America um, around African continent for free trade agreements. Is, is there something that we can learn from them? Are we benchmarking with those kind of continents to see what can and what cannot work? Because we've seen um, very good uh, stories of both the South American continent as well as European Union, but also the opposite. So are there learnings and are we benchmarking with them? Thank you. Let me take those uh, few questions and then we can open it up for some more questions. Do uh, raise your hands even as I respond so that we can be efficient with the time as well. So uh, Trish, yes, in terms of the connectivity, 
the interesting thing about how African economies are structured are we have the, the formal economy, which is actually a smaller aspect of um, the economy compared to the informal economy. And the informal economy is really um, an innocuous, largely uncaptured um, trading, um, trading community and I think it would be very interesting to consider how to map the connectivity across these two levels of integration on the African continent. So the African formal economy connectivity, uh, I'm sure there's quite enough data to indicate what the, as I mentioned, it's only about 15 to 20% intra-regional trade, but we don't quite have the figures of the informal economy and the connectivities that are happening across borders here. Um, as we know, a lot of these movements are unmitigated mitigated, um, unchecked, and unmeasured. So that's definitely an interesting point to consider, to think about the connectivity across the continent. And then uh, to think of the different contributors and the different economies, uh, definitely, Kerry, this was a consideration and continues to be a challenge for the African continental free trade area. In fact, in 2018, during the Kigali summits, there was some disappointment when the two largest economies, Nigeria and South Africa, were hesitant to sign the agreement and only actually agreed to sign uh, with another 10 other countries uh, in dates uh, after the summit. And this is because there are some concerns around integrating economies that operate so differently. I'll just reach one to our colleagues there. Uh, so yes. Uh, there are different levels of uh, economic performance and there has not quite been uh, the negotiations are ongoing in terms of how to integrate across these different performing low to medium uh, and very poor economies as well. Um, six of the poorest uh, economies in the world uh, exist in Africa, I think with Malawi being one of them. Yes, we can definitely gain a lot of lessons from the EU and Brexit. And when talking about protectionism, I should actually have mentioned Brexit as well as a key indicator that um, these economic communities are not necessarily foolproof. And um, going forward, we may need to consider the idea that not all countries will be committed to the African continental free trade area. Um, yes, let me say that we're tracking the EU and Brexit and there possibly are lessons to learn there. The key thing is that as the continent mm -hmm. integrates more regionally, um, the issue is that there will be restrictions on the autonomy of the different member states. As the regional policies and norms come into place, then um, the decisions of individual states may be more subject to uh, the regional and in integration bodies and requirements. And there may definitely be some resistance on this going forward. Um, Yes, I think that's responded to those particular questions, saying yes, that we are tracking the lessons, but also in terms of the new models. I think there's an opportunity for the African Union and the African region um, learning from the lessons of other regions to avoid the mistakes and to perhaps put measures in place that can anticipate some of the challenges going forward. Are there any more questions, comments? Feel free to also drop a chat note. Perhaps I could speak a bit more on the issue of COVID-19 as well, um, as was raised. And <laughs> yes, is there a question? I see here Galaxy S10. Can you do a word Chinese? Okay. Galaxy S10, would you like to go ahead? Um, thank you, Dr. Njeri, for your presentation. Uh, mine is uh, basically on um, whether there have been any studies in terms of um, using one currency across um, the African continent. Thank you.
So let me um, continue the thought on the COVID-19 and the fact that, yes, indeed, your, uh, Nambul, I believe, your observations that it's the economies that have some, some wiggle room that are able to do a shutdown, although I'm not quite sure if South Africa has uh, <laughs> wiggle room, but they're doing a shutdown anyway. But I think it will be especially important to track um, how economies and governments are responding to the pandemic, but also the assistance and the cooperation that will be required into the next two years um, dealing with the fallout of this pandemic. And I think we might see countries pushed into collaboration. We've already seen it with China sending goods, uh, doctors, medical supplies to Europe. We've seen it with Cuba also sending their medical supplies to facilitate um, fighting the pandemic in Europe. And I believe that if the situation becomes quite dire, on the continent, we'll see both strong and weak economies and countries cooperating um, to handle the virus as, as conducively as possible. In terms of one currency, yes, there have been uh, attempts specifically within the Western African region around what they're calling the ECHO. And this is very much related to an ongoing debate on the continued economic connections between Francophone, some Francophone African countries and France, in that these countries do deposit a percentage of their um, reserves and of their treasury funds with the French ministry. And there are uh, concerns from both a historical perspective, um, but also from a current economic perspective with that relationship. And so the ECHO is an attempt to begin to move the conversation more towards an integrated Western African economy that is less dependent on the French um, relationship. So I would say that that is the one example, but there are conversations that are occurring, for instance, within the Eastern African region and uh, Southern Africa, for instance, already has a, a customs union, which is one step towards uh, establishing a monetary union going forward. I see we have a question and in the chat box. Of all the countries okay. in Africa, which countries seem to be warm towards the idea and why? Well, I would say that the 54 African states that have signed uh, are warm to the idea, otherwise they wouldn't have signed. But there was definitely resistance from different uh, countries on different aspects of the union. And the movement of people was mentioned. So as we know, xenophobia is an issue within South Africa. And uh, allowing for the free movement of capital will definitely, and, and a strong economy as South Africa will certainly attract um, resources and, and a workforce from across the African continent. And that may have some uh, social repercussions at a community level here. So I think within the different, different national and local contexts, we might find different levels of resistance, but politically and in terms of policy and heads of state commitment, all 54 African states have um, signed the agreement and committed to implementing it starting July 2020. Najiri, do you think that um, the next 40 years is a realistic period in order to, to actually affect this, this change? Because I mean, it, it seems to me like a very, very small window of time if you think of the, the, the size, you know, the sheer size of the, of the continent and the number of countries, so, you know, 55 countries, whereas if I think of the, of the EU, and I obviously don't want to limit my mind because it's a completely different scenario, but, you know, the EU is half of that. Um, so I'm just wondering what you think, whether that this is a realistic period. I mean, Thanks, I, 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 think, I, think, I think there are many positives, um, don't get me wrong, but and the population is also growing so you know in terms of the, that huge I don't think I'd actually even be able to write down in in zeros the three trillion three trillion dollars you know does that account for population growth over the period mm. thanks Kerry I will get to that question I see there's also one here from Silesom hello hello hi how are you Dr. Sherry yeah, uh, thank you for the great presentation and I think it, uh, it's keeping us warm and thinking about how this 
uh, project to run and, and benefit maybe most of us, even us uh, developing countries in mainly. I mean, Swaziland, uh, at RSSC. So I'm wondering uh, on how these countries are, are getting to sign uh, this agreement. Is it informed by opportunities they are seeing there? Or it's just a matter of association that uh, if I don't sign, I'll be excluded. And if it's uh, based on seeing opportunities, what kind of opportunities are they skewed towards? Or what mm. which kind of uh, opportunities, maybe industries, are they thinking of if they are submitting even to that extent? Because I think the, those benefits to, to the countries would necessarily mean that they are signing to stay or they're just putting a foot in it and they will pull out very soon. Because if there's yeah. no opportunity for them, really the sustainability of it is at risk. Thank you. Definitely, thank you for that question. Yeah. Are there any other questions before I respond to Kerry and Cece? I see that we do have two questions in the chat box. Um, are you able to see those? One from Tini and one from Norm Bulag. I don't see them, no. Okay, let me read it to you. Uh, so we've got, okay. in order not to isolate the continent, to what extent are we engaging with G10 countries, for example, for their support and inputs into ACFDA? That's the first question. And then the next mm -hmm. question is, just a follow up on the one currency for Africa, in view of the 4IR and cryptocurrency era, what are your thoughts on achieving the one currency, i.e. any possibility of one cryptocurrency? Mm. Great, thank you. Yes, I can see the chat here as well. So, okay, so let me begin with the um, question from, from Kerry on, on the 40 years. It's an interesting question. So there's definitely a possibility and a plausibility in terms of the timeline that the heads of states are um, committed to. They should really have uh, the free trade area up and running by 2020 and um, already beginning to contribute to GDP growth continent-wide by 2022. One of the major challenges for this is that um, it's going to require a lot of financing. It's going to require a lot of trade financing um, from the amounts of about $50 billion up uh, to begin to mobilize agriculture, industry, manufacturing, uh, continent-wide, including the infrastructure requirements for that trade. And given the current downward turn of the global economy during to the, during the, um, due to the pandemic and the anticipated slow recovery time, I think that this will definitely impact the implementation timeframes for the continental free trade area. However, we've also seen that um, when governments have will and pressure, they can definitely act. So that's not to say that there won't be a situation, perhaps the COVID situation itself, um, that might not create some impetus that ensures we do meet the African continental free trade area timeframes and have a political and harmonized economy um, for the continent by 2063. And then in terms of the opportunities, it's, I think, CC, that's a, um, a very astute um, consideration that many countries perhaps are, their motivations for signing the treaty may be along sort of uh, peer, peer lines. So doing what other countries do because it's the right thing to do. You're a member of the African Union. So um, if the African Union is requesting its membership to sign and ratify certain agreements, then you might be uh, willing to, to concede on that level alone, but that doesn't necessarily translate into commitment to implementation. And I think this will be something very interesting to track going forward. I think smaller economies see this as an opportunity to offer some security to their otherwise fragile economic and political environments. Um, larger economies such as South Africa, specifically within the corporate sector, I think see the opportunities in terms of market growth um, and in terms of uh, being able to capture larger components for their own um, profit and investment uh, interests. 
So larger economies have the potential to, to gain a lot and um, weaker economies have the potential, I suppose, to gain some support. But these dynamics will be very interesting to track going forward and it will be interesting to try to understand what the motivations of each country are. In terms of the cryptocurrency and how the digital um, sphere might impact the economic integration approaches for the continent, this is also an interesting field to, to watch. Many African countries have actually made cryptocurrencies illegal, and there are very few legal frameworks to guide how cryptocurrencies could work within the continent. And in terms of um, sort of the security complex around 4IR, there are some concerns that we don't have the capacity to regulate cryptocurrencies, or there are some concerns within government spheres that the government doesn't have the capacity uh, to regulate cryptocurrencies and what might this mean in terms of power dynamics um, and shifting of power bases based on um, you know wealth and capital there's also the potential of course for the um, cryptocurrencies um, the blockchain technologies that inform cryptocurrencies to implement or to be implemented or to influence governance frameworks as well so to apply blockchain technologies more within governance approaches and models um, that will lead more to a decentralized Africa. So it will decentralize decision making, decentralize uh, budgeting and financing and fiscal policies um, to more localized and smaller communities around the continent. So there is some interesting uh, developments to track around blockchain technologies, around cryptocurrencies. We're still seeing a lot of restrictions uh, in terms of legalities for that. Nigeria C. Mbulisi is asked, how will the ACFTA address the fragmentations of ethnicity and leadership regimes as they have great potential to downplay the No Border Initiative? Yes, I think that's a wonderful question. And I think one of the main challenges actually to the African Continental Free Trade Agreement will be not so much the policy regimes um, and, and, and the paperwork. I think the paperwork will probably you know, move along. It will be about implementation and it will be about locating the implementation within the business communities, within the economic communities, within the social communities um, within, on the African continent. And as I mentioned, the issue of xenophobia is a good example of how um, even if you have policy frameworks that allow for the free movement of people and that attract uh, you know capital goods and people it doesn't necessarily translate into a cohesive prosperous harmonious social context in fact we're seeing that there might be a lot of challenges competition um, and even conflict that may come out of, of these zones so i think it will be very important to see how the messaging of the african continental free trade area translates to businesses organizations communities and also individuals Jerry, I have a, a message that's coming here. Um, I'm a proponent of intra-Africa trading, which is doable in theory. However, my concern is with established multinational corporations and their monopoly and oligopoly tendencies. How are we going, how are we going to address that? Again, a very good question. This is wonderful because <laughs> I can see that um, the participants are really engaging in, in these uh, considerations. Uh, beyond the international um, financial community and the multilateral agreements there, it's also important to consider the ongoing bilateral agreements between many African states and um, their former colonial uh, and imperialist nations. So, um, we're still seeing, for instance, individual African countries making trade deals that are not necessarily harmonious with the African continental free trade area with international partners. And I think this conversation will really have to go to a broader level, to the international level, so that we can begin to engage the international community around the vision of the African continental free trade area. If you recall the slide that showed the steps of progression of integration, um, one of those steps would be established a customs union which would mean that the African community trades as a block with other international partners and therefore has harmonized rules and policies that dictate the kinds of international partnerships and trade relations each African country can have but we're not yet seeing this um, we're not yet seeing these developments probably because of the extent to which African countries and economies remain very reliant and dependent on partnerships with other international communities, countries, and bodies as well. 
Um, I don't know if there are any other hands raised. It would be great to hear another voice if you're, if someone feels like sharing some thoughts. Otherwise, we can continue to take questions through the chat function. And of course, Laura, I'm also conscious of time. Do we have any more questions? We have the experts online with us so we can get her to answer them for us. Anybody have any questions? I don't see any more hands coming up and I don't see more messages coming through. Uh, Niju, do you have any final thoughts you'd like to share with us? Just to say thank you very much to all the colleagues that have participated, that um, are online this morning, that were listening to the talk. I hope that you received some interesting points to reflect on, perhaps have some questions that you can go on and think on a bit more. This is a very exciting time, even in a moment of crisis for the continent, because it's an opportunity for us to get our act together and for us to maximize on the current impetus we're seeing around decision making in our leadership and for businesses and communities to get engaged in this new policy and environment towards shaping it in a way that's beneficial um, for the businesses that are operational uh, within within the African region. So I hope that um, there have been some interesting points to take away, to reflect on, to build on within your own individual professional capacities, um, but also to, to contribute towards this new and emerging context for the African continent and of course for the world as well and for everybody to please stay here stay safe and uh, keep healthy. Nigeria I see we have one last question that's come through would we be able to take it? Certainly. All right yes. it's, a, it's a raised hand I'll just uh, unmute there please do ask your question. Hi Angel is it me? Hi. Yes it is you. Oh yeah 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 um, so so I'm, I'm wondering, I, I think it's a, the concept, it, it's, it's, it's still coming and very interesting. And uh, I would think there's a lot of uh, research opportunities uh, within the concept itself. As I've been listening to the question and answer sessions, I think we're still uncertain with a lot of things and, and how we do them. And would you like to share some ongoing research and areas you, you would want other interested researchers to, to put their heads on? Yes, thank you very much for, for that question and for, for that invitation as well. We are currently planning to convene, <laughs> depending on how uh, the next few months unfold, but we're planning to convene a masterclass that will bring together policymakers, leaders, entrepreneurs, investors, international uh, business people, as well as local communities to discuss the African continental free trade area and to possibly come up with possible, uh, possible policy advisory um, components for leadership and policymakers to consider. Some of the questions that we are thinking on are the questions that were raised this morning by yourselves. So how does the um, policy framework translate on the ground for businesses and communities? How do we take the movement towards cohesion and use this to address the fragmentation across ethnicity, across different levels of political regimes, across different economic performance uh, trajectories for African countries. So how do we take the concept and practically apply it? These are some interesting points to consider on. As a business, um, as an organization, to what extent are you uh, trading with other partners within the African continent? What is your African footprint and what are you finding to be the challenges and what would you like to see uh, in the near to distant future to facilitate your own business agendas, interests and initiatives? Some of the other questions to consider as well are, 
in a time of protectionism and in a time of a demand for new models, how can this emerging policy framework fill that gap? And what are the innovative um, and lessons from praxis that we can contribute? What are the best approaches that we can contribute that can help us shape the African continental free trade area in a way that's creative, new, uh, not only for the continent, but perhaps with lessons for the international community as well. So to encourage you to continue reflecting on the question questions that you raised um, and to share with, with the broader African community as well. And do keep track of the work that's happening at the Institute for Futures Research and of course also at the USB Ed, which deals very much with the African business context and environment as well. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Nigeri. I think we've all gained so much from this session, which is so timely. Uh, before everybody leaves, I would like to just uh, make notes of a few things. So firstly, I'd like to, I'm going to pop a poll live right now. And I'd like you to just take a moment to uh, indicate it's, it's an anonymous poll. So you can just quickly, there's three questions, just three questions we're asking you just to indicate it's anonymous. We won't know who you are, but the feedback that we gain will help us to improve on these sessions in the future we would like to be able to host many, many more of these, this being our very first one. So thank you for your patience with us. Um, we are, are happy to be able to continue doing business. Uh, so many businesses are struggling at the moment. Uh, many businesses have had to shut down entirely. And thanks to the nature of what USB Executive Development does and the infrastructure and technology available to us, we are able to continue operating. So we, we ask you to keep an eye on our website and on our social media as we continue to communicate our plans. Um, our staff are standing by and ready. We are able to answer your emails and your questions and your phone calls. So, so do keep communicating with us. Uh, the slides will be shared afterwards as well. So we will make those available to you. And um, yes, any, if you have any other comments or notes that you'd like, you're welcome to pop me even a private message on the chat um, or contact us on our email, events at usb-ed.com. Any feedback post this session, we welcome. We would like to tailor this to really add benefit to you in a way that is going to enable you to continue doing what you need to do um, and to continue in these difficult times. And we also ask you to be safe, to exercise caution, and, and we, we will do this together as an African continent. Thank you so much, Njeri, for your insights, for your wisdom, and for your time and cooperation with us in this process. So I'm going to be, uh, this poll will be up for another, say, 30 seconds, and then we'll be drawing it to a close. Thank you to my colleagues who've joined in with us today. Thank you for all your contributions and questions and insights. And we, we wish you all well. It's a Friday, so we're all going to give that last push. And I think we're all going to celebrate our weekends, uh, at least here in South Africa. We're going to be doing it quite differently. So wishing you all very, very well. Thank you so much for your time this morning. And we look forward to doing this very soon in the future again. Bye-bye.